What is going on, you fine folks? Welcome on inside yet another edition of the Business of Social Podcast, powered by STN Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley. Each and every show, we talk to the experts to get their expertise and their advice on the ever-changing social digital marketing landscape. This show is no different. Producer Will, episode number 82, as we go back into the 80s and the athletes and the receivers, most likely. But we were talking before the show, Will. You're not too pleased with the list at 82. I was surprised. I just assume every number in 80s is just littered with Hall of Famers. Um, <laughs> and the pick of the litter. 82 is pretty small. A trio of NFL guys. Uh, Raymond Barry, John Stallworth, and Ozzie Newsom. Woo. Was Ozzy the, the – was he the Ram? I forget. Um, I believe – no, I don't know if he was, but Raymond Barry was Johnny Unitas's like go-to receiver for years. And what's the, who's the second? The second one's the only one I recognize. <laughs> uh, John Stallworth. Yeah, John Stallworth. He was what? 49ers? Where was he at? I have no idea. All right. So this is the John Stallworth podcast right here on the <laughs> Business of Social. Uh, we are going to be speaking with the director of social media. We're going to be speaking with the Director of Social Media Strategy at MIT. Jenny Lee Fowler will join us on the program. A referral by the great Tatiana Holyfield. I got to tell you, Will, uh, if you ever take some time off for producing the podcast, I mean, Tatiana just doing doing God's work over there with these intros. She is on the connecting Hall of Fame, Mount Rushmore, whatever you want to say. She yeah, knows give her, everybody. Give, put a jersey in the rafters. It's 100%. a wrap. She's obviously, obviously won that one. Um, so I'm excited for this one. Uh, MIT. Obviously, a historic brand. The reason why I want to talk about this one, Will, is A, I love kind of talking to education, CPG, apparel, all the different industries. I think you can learn so much from each of them, as I always say. But also, MIT, what a historic brand. Uh, so much prestige, so much, uh, you know, uh, thought when it goes, when you say that name, people have like a connection to it. They, what, Will, what comes to mind when you hear MIT? If David Brickley was graduate MIT, what do you, what are you thinking? Yeah, I, I was thinking that when I was talking to Jenny before, like to to work there, but maybe not have attended the school almost comes yes. with this level of prestige where like everything you say is like, oh, from MIT, this person works at MIT. Like there is a lot of uh, cachet that goes with that name. So with that cachet, how do you represent a brand? How do you lead social, especially through the last three years, right? With COVID and all the different things happening politically, how does MIT show up and make sure it, it's a kind of a stressful job, right? Because, I mean, everybody's putting you on a pedestal and it's really easy. I'm sure people are just waiting to knock you off. So I'm excited to kind of dig in and see how she approaches uh, working for a brand like that, that so many people have uh, high regard to. So looking forward to it. Here she is, the Director of Social Media Strategy over at MIT, Ginny Lee Fowler. All right, so we bring on Jenny Lee Fowler. She's the director of social media strategy at MIT. Uh, Jenny, this is the closest I will ever get to MIT, so I'm oh, really stop. excited about this conversation. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> thanks so much for the time. I appreciate it. Uh, can you give the listeners a, a quick glance on what you oversee day to day and what your day consists of over sure, at MIT? Sure. Um, so you know, when it happens. When it comes to um, institutional campaigns or announcements or anything that has to do with um, the president of MIT, you know, from the central office, you know, that's where I come in. Um, that's what I handle. I also handle the day-to-day -day management of our flagship social media channels. Um, I also managed our social media working group, which is a community of social media managers and people who manage social media managers within the okay. MIT community. And I help to consult, advise, um, just um, I'm here for for that community, to support that community as well. So that's just sort of a nut, in a nutshell, um, my description and gosh, you know, day to day, it's just, I mean, it's po like posting, po um, that's probably the most consistent thing, but man, stuff just pops up. <laughs> Yeah. Especially the past three years, it's been sort of um, nutty. So uh, it can be different. It's a different adventure every day, it feels like. Walk me through your team. I know on college campuses, it's it's nice sometimes. You can tap into students or, or go-getters in that regard, but then you have to kind of retrain every couple of years because those students go on and uh, graduate, things like that. So what's your, I guess, dedicated team look like and how do you tap into uh, some of those hungry students that want to help out too? Sure. So um, there are departments that utilize students a lot more than we do. I'm I'm okay. in the Institute Central Office of Communications, our our um, division of student life and our admissions um, 
uh, department. Definitely, it's, I think, all, all their content creators, I think, are students, and they, they're amazing. Um, we awesome. do want to um, tap into that a little, little bit more, so we're exploring it. But for us, um, I... So I don't have any direct reports, but I I work um, with amazing professionals in the Office of Communication. So we have like a graphic designer, we have a video producer, producer, we have a team of like reporters, and I just, you know, work alongside with them and they're great about, you know, giving me what I need for our social channels. So um, it's, yeah, it's amazing to be able to collaborate with, you know, such amazing, talented people every day. I think one thing that everybody can relate to is how to speak on behalf of the brand, right? And MIT is such a recognizable brand. It holds so much esteem that, you know, each and every tweet, like there could be a potential where you um, maybe say something that doesn't line up to that prestige or line up to what people perceive it as. So I know I'll, I'll speak to you obviously on the MIT side, but any listener out there can understand when they're speaking on behalf of Nike or Patagonia, whatever mm -hmm. it may be, they kind of have to ladder up to this North Star or make sure that it stays within voice and tone. So mm -hmm. how has that been for you? Because I'm sure it's been difficult to always uh, ladder up to that as pop culture events happen, as you know, uh, news events happens, like what the MIT voice is and how they're going to uh, speak about this. Incident. Yeah, totally. So, you know, when I first, you know, <laughs> I think someone had asked me this and I didn't realize in my head for some reason, I, I thought I was at MIT for uh, five years, but it's been seven. <laughs> I can't oh, wow. believe it's been seven years. Um, so, but when awesome. I first got to MIT, that was the, that's the scariest thing, right? Is to, yeah. you know, when you're, when you're given control of these, um, you know, channels, it's, it, you know, my first job was to really um, get up to speed on, you know, the voice and the institutional voice, mm -hmm. and then to use, to make that voice appropriate for social media channels. So, right. um, you know, it's not something, you know, MIT was around a lot longer than I got there and it'll be, we'll be there years after I, I'm not around or, or I leave, um, which I don't plan to, but you know, if that's the case, um, but it's, it's, so it's not that I created it. It was really, it was really important for me to learn what that institutional voice was, but just to sort of make it, um, you know, cause it's social media, social media at the end of the day should be, there should be some levity and lightness and, and, and playfulness to it. And so to, it was my job to bring out sort of that side of um, our our culture and our personality um, to showcase that on our social media well, channels. Well, you know, put, put your consultant hat on for me. If you were consulting for brands, because you've obviously always had to make sure it's on voice, on, on tone. Mm -hmm. What's the easiest way to do that? What have you found be successful in order to make sure you do that? Because I'm sure there's a lot of, a lot of brands out there that um, need to kind of check their balances, cross their T's, dot their I's when there's a big moment to speak about. Uh, what have you found be successful or helpful for you to make sure that you stay on tone or stay on voice? Well, you know, I'm, I'm constant, well, I'm, I'm constantly talking to people, right? It, it shouldn't just, it shouldn't just be me. So I'm, I'm yeah. always um, talking to a group of people. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah. if it's something that I just need to, um, you know, ask if I'm not sure about, I do have like a group of like people that I always tap into and they don't all look like me. We all look different. Cause I, yeah. you know, I, cause I want different perspectives. Cause, and I'll ask them and they all, they always know if I ask them, how does this sound? I need a really quick turnaround. Right. So they're always, um, they're really aware of that. And I'll, you know, I'll say, what am I missing? Does, how does this hit? Is this hitting? Okay. And, and sometimes it's, it, you know, they'll spot something I, I missed and, you know, and I trust them complicitly, you know, impl implicitly. So um, I, I've altered it or have not posted it because, you know, because of their consultation, but I think it's just, um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a team effort. <laughs> I know, no, I know a, that sounds really hokey, but it is a no, team No, it's a good effort. point. Cause I, I think I, I stress to my entire team, obviously on the agency side, but I think often people think that, well, I'm the only person in the department. I have to kind of figure this out and being able to run stuff by like, you can't, I always say you can't QA your own work. You can't double check your own mm -hmm. spelling. Your brain plays tricks on you. So like, hey, this seems good to me, so but can you true. poke any holes? Can you gut check for me? I did that this morning with a with a colleague. Uh, like, hey, can you gut check this for me? I think this is the right 
answer, but I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything. So mm -hmm. I, I do love that advice. I don't think it does seem simplistic, but I don't think enough people <laughs> take that into consideration. It's so um, important. Mm -hmm. That being said, you mentioned at the top, there's been so many things, uh, not only for leaders, but for uh, leaders of brands on social specifically with George Floyd, anti-Asian hate, the Capitol insurrection, uh, Black Lives Matter, the life, the, the list goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. How have you at MIT, I mean, does each one of those moments, like do you have to bring in the dean and, and big decision makers to see how you're going to really address these situations? Do you stay away from some and not so much others? How do you uh, kind of address when those political moments are happening? Yeah, so, um, you know, the fortunate thing for me is that um, they have never given me orders or, you know, they, they they trust my opinion and they trust my recommendations when it has to do with social. Um, but um, so it, they've never said, oh, we need to put out this specific tweet or, you know, so it's, it's I, you know, it's, that's great. I, I work in a really great environment that way. But I think I connect, I think I connect groups of people in that if I know that leadership is about to put out a statement or, you know, there's going to be a letter from my president to the community, I immediately, you know, I have this um, space, like all of our social media, we have a social media working group Slack channel, and everyone's Got very, it. very engaged. So immediately, I'll go onto the Slack channel and say, if anyone's thinking about putting out a statement, just hold for a minute, you know, if you could just hold, because there is going to, you know, the president is currently working on it, we might Got see it, it at five o'clock today. So, um, yep. you know, for me, I just really connect our community with information that I might be privy to, but I make sure that they get it as well. Yeah, one thing too that just like for our listeners to understand, I think it's important to get those uh, messages messages right opposed to quickly. I don't think a lot of the community is saying, "Wow, it's two thirty p.m. and MIT hasn't said anything yet." I think if it takes you an extra hour, but I think there's this like restless because we're so close to the brand, right? And we're refreshing our really? own brand's Twitter, own brand's Instagram. But like you said, let the president put the press release out first, and let's make sure it all ladders back up to that messaging rather than being too quick. I think a lot of brands made that mistake feeling, I guess, you know, not the peer pressure, but just uh, seeing everybody else come out and say stuff. So they wanted to quickly get it out there and they fumbled that uh, that messaging. Totally. And, I, you know, I would argue that it kind of is peer pressure. Like a, a lot of, you know, yeah. a lot of the managers, when you're a social media manager, you're in that space and you're looking yeah. at it and it just feels... I mean, literally, I've been there where my heart starts to race and I just anxiety. Have to, yeah. Yeah. And I just have to take a step back. And, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, is this a space where like MIT needs to, you know, like say anything yeah. about, you know, it, I mean, it does it does it have to do with our culture, you know, because it's um you know, you want you want to be a part of the conversation. You want to comfort people. You want to say, "I care about this," but it's right. it's so easy to get it wrong. <laughs> it's so easy to get it wrong um, that you, unless it's you know a hundred hundred percent right, or or you know, unless it's in your wheelhouse, it's better off not to you know, really not to say anything. That's what yep. that's always my recommendation. Yeah. So the next thing I wanted to bring up is actually this blog I came across on Sprout Social before you and I were even introduced, but it was the four types of organic social content you need to drive engagement. The reason I want to bring this up is because I think any listener right now can get a lot of value out of this. And you put a lot of time into this, not only with what you saw from your own brand, but uh, looking at other brands and seeing what's working as well. So we'll go through the four real quick and just give me your thoughts Great. on yeah. on each. Uh, the Cliff Notes version of people are too lazy to read, I guess. Um, <laughs> but the first Perfect. one was content that intersects your culture with the current moment. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I just mean when, um, you know, it's it's sort of relevant and, and plays a part of your your culture and is on brand for you. Just, you know, one uh, example that I give is that for a while there was a debate on whether GIF was pronounced GIF or JIF. And it's GIF. You know, <laughs> and don't get me Pina started. Butter, I'm in a good mood, Jimmy. Don't get me. Don't get me started. Over here. <laughs> I know <laughs> it makes very, some people very comfy. But yeah. um, you know, Jif peanut butter was very clever, and then they chimed in um, on their Twitter account. So that's just uh, that's just such a great opportunity for you to like post something that's just well. Clever so many fun. people forget that so so much of social media is being social, and right. if you <laughs> exactly. if you overhear someone in a corner talking about something that you uh, enjoy, you can pop in and have a conversation. The second point you. Said, said here was content that features 
your community's rallying point. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, in higher ed, it could be a mascot. You know, anytime you put a mascot, yeah. you know, with a guest or, you know, on a field does really well. It could be like the iconic building that everyone recognizes to be part of your campus. It's during the fall or during a snowfall, yeah. you know, just in the current moment, people really, really enjoy that, especially your audience, because it's very nostalgic. Yeah. Yep. As we record this, we're getting into March Madness, where I think a lot of brands end up getting into the mix because it's on everywhere. All every office has a pool 100%. and different things, so mm-hmm. anybody can relate to it. The third one I've been talking about for suit. It's probably been a couple of years now, but raw or unpolished videos. I mm-hmm. highly agree with this. This is the most engaging content on social. But what have you found in uh, in your research? Yeah, totally. Like you know, if you know your audience, you know what your audience is going to like. So you know, there's there was this one video, and it wasn't even horizontal. Um, you know, it was it was vertical before, yeah. you know, before that was really, really popular. But there was a student that posted it and they they had this mechanical like on their mortar board for graduation. They had this thing that moved in and, and it formed the letters MIT. And it was very intricate. And, and they just posted like a nine second video of it. And we just asked, can we use this? And it and it got like thousands of likes. Yeah. It, it did really well. So I think don't ever over. You know, don't overlook those really well, simple but really engaging videos. A lot yeah. of my colleagues struggle with this because usually they ladder up to a CMO that, you know, cut their teeth on linear television ads right. and that needs to be very 4K, highly produced. And it is tough. I think you spend three months on a mini documentary or something like that and it costs you 90 grand to make and it gets little engagement. But then the raw UGC highlight ends up getting <laughs> I know. So I know I know the industry it's like so it hurts, but you got to kind of play the hits, right? It's like radio, play the top 10, totally, and, totally. Um, get your audience it, to enjoy it. And that's what social is. It's like content mm-hmm. more made by people like yeah. for people yeah. in the moment. So mm-hmm. yeah. I love it. Your fourth and final one is content that plays on your community's sense of humor, which kind of ladders up to potentially one or two, but walk me through that one. Yeah. No, I, you know, I just have found that if you can kind of play on your, um, your cult, your audience's sense of humor, you know, like sort of a joke. Yeah, everyone, first of all, everyone likes to be a part of an inside joke, right? Yeah. But the joke has to be something that everyone finds funny for the same reason. It's not, we're not poking fun of anyone, but it, it's just something that we all find funny and we all have that in common. And that type of content just does really, really well. Does, I think yeah. some of, you know, some of my favorite, um, some of my favorite accounts are just because they're so witty. They're so funny, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, the fifth one I would say too, if for any brand is really, you know, peeling back that curtain into the behind the scenes. I think so many people enjoy uh, getting to know brands and how it goes into making their product. Or if you're a sports team, getting to go inside the locker room or how the uh, equipment guy gets all the jerseys ready for the locker and stuff like that. And I think oftentimes people think, you know, what can I post on my, on my, on my handles? And ultimately it's like, what is the things that are exclusive to you and your brand that nobody else can do? It's What's true. the access that you have that nobody does? Um, and, you know, like you said, the mascot prepping for its dance for the upcoming March madness mm-hmm. halftime show or what have you, you know, those are things that only your account could do and nobody else can. So that's why people will come more for more. So that's a, yeah. uh, that's another bonus one we could throw in there. Yeah, that's a great that's a great one. I yeah. actually have an example if you don't mind me. Yeah, for sure. It. It. But yeah. you know, we have like the um mini cheetah. We have like the cheetah robot that's like very MIT and it's specific to MIT. And there was a video that was done, but um the, the scientists that took the video, they put bloopers at the end, like all of the times the cheetah like fell yeah. over or they pushed it and it just didn't work. It, they were really funny, but the crazy thing is the um the analytics, the metrics show that they had watched to the very end because there are so many view mm-hmm. the views were to the very end and and people were commenting about how like what was stay tuned for the bloopers the bloopers are worth it and so like a lot of people were commenting and so i thought wow this is a great way to get people to watch an entire video to the very end yeah. of it if you show if you show mistakes <laughs> and, uh, and failures right yeah on tiktok it frustrates me because like stay tuned for part two like go to the profile for part three like ah you're making me do all this work but uh the (laughs) the cliff the cliffhanger is getting me um i was curious when i when i was looking you up you know there's so many things that an education um brand would have to be responsible for right student recruitment but also talking to your alumni but also speaking to the immense amount of awards and or just like things that are happening on campus so how do you and this is good for any brand too like how do you determine 
Uh, what do you have like a kind of a Bible of what percentage that you want to make sure you hit those different points? Is it just kind of random per week? How do you make sure you speak to each of those buckets? Or oh, audiences? gosh, I, I have to say that I don't have an actual number. Um, yeah. I it just I just want to make sure that it's a good cadence. And I realize, you know, our audience is a global audience, but I do I do know that alumni is a percentage of that. You know, um, students are a percentage of that. And we do post, um, you know. Uh, content that is specific to, but ho we're hoping relevant to all. Um, and it also show shows our culture. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So in the case of like, you know, what was going on during COVID and all of the things that we were doing, we might be talking specifically to our on-campus community, but I think it showed the global community, the steps we were taking to make yeah. sure our community was safe and what we were doing. Um, and it also speaks to, you know, like alumni can see what we were doing on campus. So I think it still was relevant to our broader audience, even though it was really something we needed our on-campus audience to know. Awesome. Let's uh let's like take a step back, ten thousand foot view, MIT or not. How do you okay. approach social overall? What's your core belief on how to approach it the correct way? Um, well, I I'm a big believer in or, organic content. I don't think things should be, you know, I I believe in being on brand. I believe in having a voice and a tone, but I don't think everything should be over stylized. Yeah, where not everything needs to have a logo Agreed. on it. Um, I think a lot of you know the the images should speak for themselves. You know the um the videos the videos should just you know you don't need like an open and a closing. In fact, audiences don't have time for that anymore. They just want you to nope. start it. So I don't think it should be over customized. I um I just think it should amplify your culture. It mm. should you know it should feature your people. You know I think I think if um with social media that I just think you should double down on your community. I think that's sort of my ten thousand. I love it. View. Yeah. What is a common mistake you see other brands making on social? Um, gosh, it's hard to, you know, so sometimes I think people, I guess this kind of goes along with what I just said. I think um, people fall into this like trap of feeling like everything needs to be cut, like every, like instead of just instead of just posting an image, they'll create this customized on brand colors, like frame for the for the image when the image itself is just beautiful yeah. you know and so if you cover if you post a frame for it then the image is even smaller on my mobile device yeah. and just and i feel like sometimes i go to some accounts and i'm just i feel like i'm just looking at the same color the same two colors you know well, i always look back at like every different mediums right if you were watching nbc there doesn't necessarily have to be an nbc border every time they have a new show that comes out that's but there can be there can be bumpers in between or what have you but it's like the that's content a great speaks example for, yeah, yeah the content speaks for itself right like i know hbo has high, very high quality stuff sure they have the hbo bug in the beginning but then throughout the content, you don't have to continually to remind the entire time. So Right. It doesn't um, yes. So I, like I just that. don't fall into that. Don't be time. don't be overly branded and make sure your content is is um, authentic to your audience. And you can also, yes. I think, tie it all together with your copy. Um or yes. and maybe the yes. theme where you're very motivational or very inspirational or whatever it may be. Copy's so every so time important. you post something, mm -hmm. that's how you could tie it all together. Uh where do you th I was wondering before I get to the next question, actually. TikTok, are you guys on it? And do you think this is the platform? I'm su assuming this, especially talk to high schoolers that are considered MIT, right? <laughs> yeah. So we are not currently, um, but I am building a strategy around You're pushing it. for it. I love yeah, it. Um, I think it's more like it's it. You know, it's it's a it's a platform that, that has there's a very very large audience, and yeah. we should. It, you know, we should be in that. It's, space. it's a number one website on the on the planet, I think, or at least in the United States. So beat out Google this year. Crazy. crazy yeah. Crazy, crazy. Yeah. 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 Um, that was a, yeah. Yeah. That was a crazy stat. But where yes. is uh, where do you think the undervalued attention is in digital overall right now that people aren't maximizing, in your opinion? I think it's LinkedIn. Mm. I am I am bullish on LinkedIn right now. I just yeah. think that that it's a, a very, very positive community. Um, they like celebrating 
you know, the the victories or great the, point. The, the wins and the success. You don't see a lot of, of trolling on uh, LinkedIn, which is which is no. nice. <laughs> yeah, and and the algorithm just feels very transparent. It just yeah. feels um and you know, it's it's a very engaged community and I just I just you know, I would encourage people to just post on it consistently and post videos well, natively in LinkedIn if you can. And again, yeah. even if you go into product marketing CPG People may say, hey, my consumer doesn't necessarily live on LinkedIn. Well, first of all, yes, they do. But second of all, even if you look at that as a recruitment, your your future prospective employees to learn more about your culture, to learn more about what you talk about. Mm-hmm. I've even found with my company that that's been such an amazing tool where people are stumbling across our content, getting a sense of our culture, getting a sense of who our clients are, mm-hmm. and kind of looking into the company um, more so than maybe that LinkedIn post getting us a new project or a new mm-hmm. job type thing. So I think that could be... Beneficial for hundred percent, and you can you can you know leverage the content to um, re- reinforce your influence in the yeah. space that you work in. Like if you, it's it's sort of a built-in blog, you know, blog yeah. site too. So if you Thought just say leadership, right? Yeah. Totally, they the the audience loves that and shares it and engages with it. So um, yeah, I'm I'm I've said it before, but I'm bullish on LinkedIn right yeah. now. It's been surprising. I love it. So how do you measure success in ROI on digital and do those things also ladder up to total recruitment goals and kind of more of those traditional goals for the university? How do you kind of look at the end of the year and say, wow, we, we crushed it or wow, we need to do <laughs> Yeah, better. it's interesting because, you know, in communications, it's always hard because um, we don't have like a, a purchasing funnel. Um, all right. of our all of our goals are um, is messaging. It's their messaging priorities. Um, and I'm fortunate with that you know, uh, admissions numbers are not my, we, we have an admissions department that takes care of that. My audience is definitely more global and broad, yep, but yep. for me, I always take it as like, my job is to, um, reaffirm, you know, our, like our place in, in the world as a, a leader in science, technology, you know, you know, um, yeah, math, math, education, innovation. Um, and so, you know, for it's, you know, I always look at engagements. Engagements is where I'm always looking to expand our engagements because if it, if I've yeah. found anything, engagements will stretch your reach, and your reach will introduce you to new people. Yep. Um, so engagements one, and then I always look for sort of those comments where you know there's someone that might say, "Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize you had this class." Or I didn't realize that you, um, you you had a school of humanities, or you know, because that that means that I'm introducing our content or to a new person that didn't realize we existed or yep. we didn't we didn't have that program. So um, those are sort of like that, val- like the valuable, the very like specific valuable um, engagements or comments that that I am looking for as well. I love that. All right, so I want to get some rapid fire questions here towards the end of the program to okay. get your thoughts on. Um, okay. Any brands, accounts, or creators that you currently follow on social that inspire you or you think do a really good job? Yeah, I mean, I my favorite is um, National Park Service. Okay. Their Instagram is just, I just, you know, they're, they're just doing a great job. And if you ever want to learn how to do great, like all text well, they, they just, I feel yeah. like they just do a, a stellar, stellar job. And they're funny. <laughs> they make me laugh on a regular basis. Um, I just started following, you're going to laugh, but um, hello, Tushy, like Tushy Bidet. Um, okay. They just have such an interest. I mean, they're talking about bidets, but they are wild. Like, I yeah. think, how would I do that? They're just wildly creative. So yeah. I just think that, the, um, you know, I love to see what they're doing because it challenges me to think in different ways. Um, my, my, my newest, follow i don't know if they're still active but the um the pay gap the pay gap Mm -hmm. app did you like where everyone so everyone when everyone was tweeting on international women's day that bot that pay gap bot would quote tweet that person's like we you know we support women like we right and that with with um and they would quote tweet it with the percentage gap of pay between genders with um it was um, it was crazy. People were deleting their original tweets, and I mean, it was it was eye opening. I don't know how active they are, but that was my f- new f- That's smart. favorite newest follow. And that I goes back to, to your uh, your recommendation of insert yourself into the conversation. Right? They found a a topic right. and, a, and a day that was going to be really important to women, and they obviously have a 
a service or technology that can help women in that regard. So yeah, totally. what, a brilliant, what a brilliant stunt. Yeah. Yeah. Don't just no more lip service. We want receipts, right? Yeah. yeah. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Any book, podcast, newsletter, blog, other than obviously Sprout Social Blog, uh, that you consume or enjoy <laughs> on, a, on yeah. a regular basis? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, are you familiar with David Perel? He's like he's deemed himself the writing guy, but he has he has a um, he has a newsletter he calls Monday Musings, and he talks about writing, but he just talks about creating in different lights. And he'll um, he'll you know he he's interviewed Kendall Lamar. Is it Kendall Kendrick, the rapper? Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick, Kendrick, Kendrick Millar. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Kendrick. Yeah, he Kendrick he's interviewed. Ken, he, and then he's um, he's interviewed. Like, I mean, he'll he'll look at Arnold Schwarzenegger and his life yep. and how he's done mar- marketing. Like, he yep. just he just really breaks it down and makes me look at like creativity and writing and marketing in different ways. And that I normally would not have. And I really appreciate his um, newsletter, Nicole Tabak. She has um, a social media detox, which I really appreciate because it just, um, she, her audience is like social media managers and just how to like give them some space between Mm -hmm. like in order to, um, you know, Bur- you know, burnout is a real issue, right? Yeah, so for just sure. to like kind of create some space between work and what you do every day to to um, for mindfulness and you know relaxation. It. She does a great job. So that's those are two of my favorites. Um, Very cool. Yeah. What are some tools or resources or apps that you use on a daily or weekly basis that just makes your life easier or makes your job easier? Yeah, like um, I I'm a big Trello user. I love yeah. Trello. Like I think that's how we manage our social content um and that's that's how i organize a lot of my thoughts and things that i create is on trello um which it's is not exactly... how many people don't have content management systems like that and yeah like, yeah i mean it's it. a project management system but we use it for our content i mean you don't yeah. always have to use it for what it's meant if it mm-hmm. works for you you know um just a definitely. place to organize all, all the things for sure yeah yeah. yeah. And, um, and you're going to make fun of me for this one, but, um, I'm a big pen and paper person. Uh, like I have I like notes and lists and lists and notes and I go back to my notes and, um, I just, you know, I've got, I've got like stacks of notebooks. Awesome. <laughs> like I just, I'm a pen to paper. Have you heard of the yeah. uh, remarkable tablet? Have you seen this? Yes. So yes. I was a big note person. I got, of course, served on Instagram via the algorithm. They got me. Uh, but I order it. And it, it really feels like you're writing on paper with that tablet. You do like it. I okay. like it a lot. And then you could just email yourself or it, it stores all your notes. Because that was the biggest issue is I would forget my notepad at my office and I want it at home. Mm-hmm. And it just it stores it all digitally in the cloud. So I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not getting paid by Remarkable, but I may have you uh, check it out. It's pretty. I like the recommendation. No, because I've yeah. looked into it. I just haven't made the leap. It's pretty expensive, but it's like it, it does. It get, gives you that idea that you are right on paper. Because I'm the same way. I think the reason why people like you and I like the paper is it makes you remember it better. And it, you know, when you're writing and thinking about it, opposed to typing and all that stuff too. So yeah. No, I've I've looked into it. I like how it, you can. Um, connected to your digital spaces too, yep. which is kind of And nice. I feel when people are typing like in a Zoom conference like this, it feels like they're typing an email or they're distracted even though they're just writing notes. So, you know, it's more of like a yeah. being, being kind <laughs> more, and not distracted. more friendly. <laughs> yeah, more friendly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, no. Well, I'll give you this. One of the last questions is, you know, folks that are looking to get into uh, overseeing a brand social, what are, what are some recommendations that you have um, that they should keep in mind? Yeah. I mean, that's, gosh, that, I mean, that's a tough question to focus. Question. You, yeah. To hone in on the, you know, the, I think the one thing I would say is like, um, <laughs> I don't know if this sounds bad. It's not, it's not about you and don't make it about you. Yeah. Right. And, 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 um, and that goes both ways. Don't, that don't way. retweet yourself on the brand. That right. Comes to right. Yeah. Don't insert yourself into the brand voice or yeah. brand, but also don't take the comments or anything they say on the brand um, account personally, like right. just, you know, just uncouple your ego, like and not, yeah. e- not being arrogant. I mean, like in the aid in the ego, like, the, <laughs> sure. the way, yeah, just like uncouple yourself from it, you know, is I what it. I would say. Yeah. And then is there anybody always ask questions to our guests? Is there anybody in your network that you would recommend that you think would make a great guest or can provide some value for the, uh, for the listeners of the show? 
Yes. Um, okay. I don't, but you might have already, have you talked to um, Christina Garnett? Who's no, I've done. HubSpot. She is um, in commu- with senior community, build- and she works at HubSpot. And, okay. I, uh, and I can definitely, can, um, I can email you back and give her her contacts. Yeah. Which, uh, um, but she is all about like community um, mm. and building community. Um, she does, she's great in that space and then um she took her call are you familiar with she just left yanko design okay she she's um she's great in like the creative space like how like create because she was like a one man i mean she's one of the one man community like social media manager you know management teams and she i think she single-handedly grew yanko design to like uh, like really absurd i mean she, she grew that um Instagram account by herself. Wow. The content she provides is really great. But I will definitely give you both. I can email Appreciate you it. both of their names. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, well, they're um, great. Well, it was so amazing meeting you over the the pod here. And thank you so much for your time. I'm glad Tatiana connected both of us. She's been a uh, one of the best recruiters for uh, uh, the business of social podcasts. I adore her. She's she's great. She's just great, and she's just what she's doing is amazing. So yeah, no, it's great. I, I'm glad we finally got to connect. It was great of course. To meet you. Well, thank you so much for your time, and we'll uh, we'll be in contact shortly. Yeah, sounds All good. Right. Take All care, right. Jenny. Bye. Bye. All right, Will, there you have it. Jenny Lee Fowler, the Director of Social Media Strategy over at MIT. Great conversation. Uh, really enjoyed her take. And she just seems like a student of the game, you know, really digging into what's working, what's not. You know, I was throwing her some questions and she had a lot of um, a lot of examples. I love the pay gap. I didn't realize that was going on, that social stunt on um, on NASA Women's Day that was happening a couple weeks ago. But yeah, I really, uh, really appreciate her take. And I love... You know what she said. This may work for all you that are talking to those C-suite executives that don't necessarily get social media. They're looking at the vanity metrics of how many followers did we gain this month. I like how she said she focuses on engagements because engagements lead to reach, and reach introduces you to new potential followers. So, if anybody's ever wondering what what that you know hundred thousand retweets actually got you, if they don't see a ton of followers, let the let the higher ups know that it's all good things. I think if you if you judge yourself based on engagements, you'll probably put yourself in a good place long term. Yeah, I think student of the game is a perfect summary of that. Yeah. Like she had a ton of knowledge about the industry, but also still um, a huge desire to learn and grow and get better. And I thought her answer about LinkedIn was really interesting. I was not expecting that at all. And I think she yeah, and I have to think about that. Points. But he, yeah, even if you are a um, apparel brand that thinks like you know people on LinkedIn aren't really caring about checking out their the next T-shirt or, or shoe. Uh, it's great for recruitment. I mean, we've seen that with ST and Digital, right? Where we our culture kind of comes across on our social media channels and people end up signing the offer letter because of just that. Uh, so it's important to get good people in your building. Those good people in your building can make you more money, can get you more followers, can get you hit you hit your goals as a company, which is always the the dream goal. So uh, really appreciate Jenny for coming on the program. Thanks again for Tatiana for the referral. Uh, we are obviously, if you're watching on YouTube, I am uh, doing a what would you call this, Will? An in-between studio episode here as I uh, yeah, shoot this in my office. Our dust episode. Shout out to Robert, by the way, for setting me up with the Fujifilm 4K here on the webcam. Got to appreciate his uh, technique here. Uh, and then Will, uh, you know, jammed himself into a closet about three by three to make it happen. But by next time, we should be in the beautiful brand new studio. I didn't tell you, Will, but I, I, I purchased some canvas this weekend for the new studio. And you're going to like it. There's going to be some surprises in there. I mean, I have enjoy. like a direct window into you now. And I feel like we're really taking steps here. Maybe a talk back button. I mean, <laughs> it's uh, nothing better than staring right in the face of Dave Rickley for 60 minutes, right? All right. So thank you to uh, you, of course, producer Will, uh, Dave Ferker, for all his help setting up the new studio 100%. Uh, as well with some of the co- contractors. And thank you to you for listening. Episode 82, we promise to have better, uh, you know, better athletes to name podcasts after in the future, hopefully. All right. Thanks so much. My name is David Brickley. It's all been powered by STN Digital.